Hello, I am Michelle Giuliano. I am the co-founder of Salt Consulting and Communications in Women Rock, Switzerland, and I am delighted to be with Emily Prelong today in order to have an inspired interview as part of our inspired interview series based on the collaborative anthology Inspired Journeys by Women Rock, Switzerland and by Swiss Made Story, Denise Nickerson, Esther Berkey, and I got together and we found 31 amazing co-collaborators who have contributed their stories. And um, I happen to know Emily Prelong quite well, but I wanted to take a second to read her bio to you because she is one very accomplished young woman who <laughs> that I'm thrilled to have the chance to meet. She's the founder and director of Radar PR. She's built a range of competencies on top of her brevet in public relations and two specializations, one in strategic writing, the other in social media. She started her career in 2007 at the Brain Mind Institute of the EPFL, followed by the National Center of Competence in Research uh, Synapse. For five years, she has closely monitored scientific research with a particular focus on neurosciences, Working at the heart of the scientific and technological hub of the Geneva Lake region was a fascinating experience where she discovered interdisciplinarity with great joy. So when Emily joined a Lausanne-based public relations agency, first as a project manager and then head of mandates, she brought along a strong desire to support meaningful projects in the field of science and health. After seven years of external PR experience with the agency, she founded her own company to dedicate herself fully to her favorite areas of interest, science and public health and society. So Emily, I'm so delighted to be with you because marrying interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary studies and research and science and public health along with the arts is really the foundation of what RADAR stands for. Thank you for joining us. Thank you a lot, Michelle, for inviting me today. <laughs> I'm very glad to be with you. And it's really, it's really my pleasure. So Amplifying Humanity is the title of your book. And you quote Victor Hugo right away, your, your story chapter, forgive me. Um, not being heard is no reason for silence. And one of the things that truly moves me about your work and radars teeming around uh, public relations is this desire to elevate underrepresented voices in the scientific community and in public health. Would you like to speak a little bit about, about your story and your, your chapter and, um, and some of the work that you're involved in? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's true that too many voices are not being listened to. And uh, I feel a lot of injustice about, about this. And uh, with Radar, we we are finding the right partners right now to get everything together and work uh, in interdisciplinarity. Um, and we have a strong focus on mental health because um, we really would like to help as many people as possible. And we have this, those communication skills that we can add to uh, the skills of scientists, the skills of health professionals or public health professionals. And um, yeah, we are trying to promote global health, which is not really the case uh, in Switzerland yet, but it's going further and further in the right direction. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, we, we really want to um, help projects with a lot of sense uh, in mental health, but in global health in general. And we use uh, public relation, but we also use uh, art, the filter of art with artists, um, and yeah, I I really I'm I'm not the only one behind Radar. <laughs> we no. are five of us, <laughs> um, and I'm really glad to have a team uh, at Radar, to have a team of coaches, to have a team of friends and family and mentors, and I could not do anything without them, and I'm really grateful that they are being part of this adventure. <laughs> well, I know that you act with team and that's something that you and I share in common. I'm, I'm also a lover of team and, uh, but you also act with tremendous passion. And part of the crux of your story for me was also just, you were very generous in, in, in your story chapter to share some of the 
I'm going to call them galvanizing moments for you and for Radar, but real, real atrocities that go on in the world. And you kind of give us a list of the situations that you've observed people as they're facing in their lives that kind of gave you some of the basis for wanting to elevate underrepresented voices in health sciences and to find the right partners to do so. Uh, so that this interdisciplinarity and this focus that you bring, even bringing the arts to help communicate about sciences and health sciences really mattered. And so just some of the things that you listed was LGBTIQA plus scientists who are held back or fearful of expanding their research in certain regions of the world because homosexuality is subject to the death penalty. Uh, also just simply being told not to publish or not uh, to that this is happening. Scientists who, whose careers are derailed by motherhood or the bias that they face as people who may someday become mothers. The impact of the global pandemic and unequal costs to female researchers, healthcare practitioners and caregivers and patients who are routinely reporting feeling unheard, disbelieved or poorly cared for. Those are just three of the top of this list that you sort of indicate about this public health uh, desire to sort of cross the bridge or cross the chasm between the research, which is so often inaccessibly written or sort of in these golden treasure troves in libraries and not necessarily available to the public who needs the information. I wanted to thank you for putting that in your story chapter. <laughs> Thank you for all noticing that. And uh, yes, it's really, well, when I was working at EPFL, I just noticed that there was not enough bridges between science and society. And I had the chance really to work with scientists who had this, or and still have this interdisciplinary approach. And for example, they were bridging neuroscience and psychiatry to domains that they didn't talk <laughs> a lot before. Um, and now you have clinician researchers that have both um, approaches and it's so strong and powerful for the next generation. And yeah, that was a great example that um, I, um, I wanted to help further. Absolutely. So when you're thinking about sharing your story in Inspired Journeys and in this book, and I guess I'm asking, what, do you, what is one thing that you feel grateful for, for having shared your story? Mm -hmm. Well, it was amazing. I'm very grateful to you, actually, and Denise Nickerson and Esther Berkey to, to have me at kind of the <laughs> kind of the short timing at, at the end, but uh, the universe was really good and uh, spot just um, how do you say as um, yeah a, a spot, spot was up. just <laughs> a spot up and up. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I was like, wow, I have a, a few a few days to write something. And uh, um, Denise Nickerson and Laurent Coderon were really kind enough to allow me to write in French so I could work uh, faster. <laughs> And I'm really grateful to that because this opened up opportunities and it's, it's open also a network of uh, 31 other uh, or 30 other women <laughs> in, in your uh, Women Work Switzerland community. And I was delighted to read about their stories and in, it, it, they inspired me as well. And really uh, sorority and stories help women go further and I'm very glad that you had this brilliant idea of this, of this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to jump in at the last second too and, uh, and nab a chapter because uh, I do think that you also hold a really important uh, cactier for us because you are Swiss. And, uh, and, and so in this international collection of stories, you know, of women living in Switzerland, you are one of the Swiss women in the, in the, in the book. Um, and so I'm grateful for that. And also um, because you're from Valais. And, uh, yeah. and this, uh, this, this part of your story, I think, is really, is really interesting because you were from a very, very small city. Do you want to elaborate about, about this part of your upbringing and how this sort of fueled you into the work you do today? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm from Valais, a little village called Prajon. Oh, I think it's the first time this this name coming in an interview. <laughs> 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 but 
Uh, well, a very small village close to the forest. So I am basically lived in the forest. I can say that. And um, as a human being, I believe in nature as a whole, and that we are all part of it. Um, and in those small villages, uh, and yeah, in the population in general. But I, I remember when I was a child, it was difficult to speak about mental health. Um, it was really I'd somewhere we don't talk about depression schizophrenia bipolar disorders etc and there was this kind of togetherness but we go together but we don't speak about mental health we don't speak about the, the problem or the issue and it's like you're in a in a in a fog <laughs> and um i realized when i was at eplfl that oh um we can speak about mental health and we should be speak about mental health. And after after years um, and the, the COVID situation we all faced, mental health became a topic and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's about time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's really, really important uh, because it helps people not being alone with their issues and I uh, I think I created Radar also because I, I want as many people as possible to know about mental health issues and not live difficult dif situations, seek help uh, sooner and yeah. uh, get the right support at the right time. Also, I think it was in your story chapter, not just in our casual conversations, but in your chapter you mentioned about the COVID-19 crisis and, uh, and how we were so willing uh, across the globe to count and measure uh, hospitalizations, not just death, uh, that were COVID related. But though you've graphed and marked and talked about the science and the research that the mental health crisis grew lock and step in a similar trajectory as the COVID crisis, and yet we are not counting uh, the the overburdened, the overworked, the under you know the the people who had to step out of work uh, for whatever reason um, or to admit themselves for care. Uh, so this unseen mental health crisis and untracked and unmeasured, kind of making it not existent um, when it when when so clearly it was it was following a similar trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we have a, a psychiatrist in our network called Camille Pigue. She um, she did some interview or a lot of interview during COVID and after, and she she said that okay, having those death numbers every day, mm. the effect on mental health was huge as well, and without too much um, well, too much resources being. Uh, enlightened at well, no, the to time. support yeah the the resourcing not being present in the same way as anything to do with physical health yes. yeah i i'm i'm fascinated by that and i don't have the answers um but i'm really glad that you communicate about it and uh, and talk about the interconnectedness um in your in your formative uh part of your story you also talk about this connection with your grandfather which was quite beautifully woven because on the one hand you know, he helped you see this uh, this desire where science was concerned to he could make things levitate and he used strong magnets and could do cool things at the at the dinner table. But you also talked about, um, you know, the the, the physical uh, struggles that he that he had struggled later in life and how this kind of brought you into interdisciplinarity as well to better understand your grandfather. That uh, it's it's a bit of a mixed up because it was my uncle who is an electrical engineer. Ah, sorry. <laughs> and, and my grandfather had a Parkinson disease. Sorry, um, that's my mistake. <laughs> but don't worry. And it is true that at the dinner table, my uncle was always with those gadgets. Do you say gadgets in English? Yeah. And we were, or I, I don't, I don't really know about my sisters, but I, I think they were, yeah. The, the thought that was funny as well <laughs> and he always brought those strong magnets and yeah it, things were um, moving around the table and you have the magnets underneath the table and yeah. it was like <laughs> <laughs> fun fun fact and I guess uh, this this stays in into my memories strongly and uh, as for my grandfather I have 
Um, he died when I was six, but mm -hmm. I really remember him. And I remember that it's strange. I remember he was not talking a lot, or this is this was my perception, but it was really there uh, with us. And um, yeah, Parkinson's disease has always been part of um, of the family, but as mental health was, but we weren't talking about that. We knew that this this mental health issues and Parkinson's disease was existing mm -hmm. in the family, but we didn't talk together about about this. And yeah, we are close, but we couldn't talk about this. And I think people need to have more uh, clues and skills to get mental health around the table. Well, and to know when it's time to seek um, additional help or resources. I don't think people have, uh, you know, we, we learn about the right arm and uh, and cardiac situations, but we don't learn about uh, what is what are the red flag scenarios? When do we need to urgently seek help and care for our loved ones? And Switzerland, you know, is one of the highest suicide rate nations on the planet. And so to not have to not have, um, you know, a really robust mental health system with cues and strategies and to understand about overwork and, and burnout and, uh, and to help people, to really provide resourcing to help people. And this is something that Radar does, right? That you're doing, um, I love the Toi et Moi, uh, uh, Toi aussi, pardon, Toi aussi, uh, your podcast for, for uh, adolescents and, uh, and youth. And that is really helping to disseminate uh, mental health awareness and circumstances. Would you like to talk about uh, some of your podcasting work with Swasi and and also uh, not just Radar Owned, but I know you've done a, a, a series for suicide and uh, and another one having mm -hmm. to do with I think it was rheumatoid. Maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yes, Swasi is a podcast on um, from about mental health uh, and the young generation. Uh, it was produced by Mai Biederman, um, uh, is in our team at Radar. And uh, we together um, reflect on what we, what we could do uh, during COVID and uh, yeah, for the younger generation. And so we um, took um, topic, uh, societal topics like um, uh, anxiety at, at school, or um, a bipolar disorder, or grossophobia, or um, trans identity. And we looked at those topics uh, with the angle of mental health. And we get, we, we've got people um, telling their stories to the world. And what we did at, at the end of each episode was giving plenty of resources where people can just go and it's not working only for one institution and saying okay there is a stop suicide uh, there for you but there is stop suicide there is la main tendue there are um mines there are many institutions that convey the same message and that's what we are trying to do with radar is it's bringing forces together on one same message and so you can spare financial resources, human resources, and you get to talk to a bigger audience if you bring forces together. And yeah, sometimes it's, it's a pity that uh, to have institutions wanting to own, own their messages because it's the same message, message from uh, several institutions. And if they can go together and are okay to 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 yeah bring resources together they can speak louder or that's what we think at radar amplify like your chapter title amplify, to amplify. Exactly. <laughs> and 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 to see it, it correct me if i'm wrong but you use youth voices right uh they're or are they always adult voices I, my understanding is that the oh, no it's is, youth voices yeah yes. um, uh, your storytellers are 25 yeah 18 to 25 mm -hmm. And they are really brilliant and they were, yeah, we are very grateful to them as well because they are helping their peers and it's beautiful, really. 
Oh, that's fabulous. fabulous. It's it's fabulous. Yeah. I wanted to ask a, a coaching question because because I'm a coach and Denise is a coach and part of our consultancy is clearly in coaching. But we wanted to ask all of the women involved in the book because we think that that you're brilliant and you're leading in your lives. Um, and so it's a personal question about how do you turn things around for yourself when you are feeling blocked or stuck or stymied or things are not going right or you're finding that you're going uh, downhill, what is one of the ways you resource yourself or pick yourself back up again or, or make sure to look out for? What do you do uh, to, mm. to pivot from the negative back into uh, into positive or more loving towards yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I get this strong support of coaches. Uh, yeah, you and, and Denise are really precious. Um, I've got a vocal coach as well, and she's helping me. Uh, and she's, um, yeah, she she's Voxalia, I can say that. So, so. <laughs> and she is really helping me one hour per week to just let everything go. And um, singing is uh, a tool. I used to let things go. And, you know, no emails, no phone calls, no blah, blah, blah. And just one hour, I can just only sing. Um, and I, I resource in nature with my family as well. And this is a very important part of our life to go outside, um, far away from the yeah, digital, um, digital world. <laughs> um, and what else? I, I, have, I have a close connection with my sisters and really great friends that help uh, in the process. So, yeah, my family, uh, my partner and my, my daughter are really important. And I, I am grateful to have such a strong team around me. This is powerful. Uh, I heard also communing with nature. Um, you talked about in your story as well, this idea that humans sometimes think that they are separate from nature or somehow apart from. Uh, and of mm -hmm. course, this interconnectedness of, of beings. Um, this is the successful cooperation and evolution of, of, of life and living, and it clearly impacts your work. Yes. Uh, yeah, I cited Katie Mack, a theoretical cosmologist. She wrote The End of Everything. And Katie I, Mack, I yeah. really recommend this book. I love it. It's pop science. I love pop science. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, this the... the um, yeah, she said that, uh, I really read it because it's easier, that you, everyone knows that at the beginning that there was the hot Big Bang. And yes. this is a term cosmologists used to talk about the time when the cosmos was hotter, denser, and in some sense smaller than it is today. Yeah. And it expanded. And it, it's, it's expanding further and further. So <laughs> I understand, I understood reading uh, Katie that yeah we were like we or everything was like this and now we are expanding but we started there and I think that this something um, we are all part of this and we we together are expanding yeah. not sure if it's astrophysically correct but um, I, re I really, really like that. And um, yeah, it, it's clear that the universe changes and evolves over time and we have to evolve. And I think that if we want to protect humanity, mm. um, we should amplify um, humanity and, mm. and see the positive and see the light because there, there is light and we have this unconscious bias of the negative. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of negative things in this world, of course, I don't deny it. No. But I think we should balance it with the positive as well, because it's consider, considered less uh, strong, like love, kindness and togetherness are roles that are often considered like a, yeah, teddy bears in French, we say bisounours stories. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm glad that we are that we meet right now at Redder for two to three years. People that are leaders and not afraid to talk about love and kindness, and this feels so great. 
It's correct, right? I mean, it is correct. I don't think that, you know, it, it is incorrect to think that excellence uh, requires unkindness. That would be crazy. Uh, it is incorrect to think that uh, that you, you know, that you, you have to build a, a, a business through deeds that are unkind, unethical, or lacking in love. And so, and so I think it is so much more coherent and consistent specifically with an ever expanding universe and the interconnectedness of all things and all people and, and therefore all information. I love that you talk about, yeah, on the one hand, this democratization of, of health science and uh, so that, so that normal people can read and understand and make the best decisions for themselves. So that they have access to best in class research and access to case studies and examples that they can use to benefit their lives and uh, and to help them with their children or with their spouse and partner or with their loved ones or to be better leaders of their staff and their teams. I love that you're in this business and I don't think that you can do it with with anything less than love and joy. And in fact, we were talking about joy and you, you brought out that it's the right time. Do you want to elaborate on uh, on the right time and place <laughs> and being joyful in your work. Yes, um, but I I think and people that are around us think as well that it's easier now to um, um, build projects uh, with the support of interdisciplinarity than 15, 30 years ago. And it's easier now to bring on uh, prevention and promotion of health as well. And we are, we are being said that it's the right time. So we are glad to be here at that time because maybe 30 years ago, uh, I don't know if radar <laughs> could have ever existed mm -hmm. because it would have probably been too soon. Perfect. Perfect. So what's next for you and what's next for radar? What are you focused on and centered on as a team? Uh, who gets to do this work uh, to the level that you do. Yeah, uh, we are developing public relation and inter interdisciplinarity once again. Uh, we are developing podcasts as well and uh, amplifying the voices of uh, human beings. Uh, and uh, our next um, uh, subjects will be on eco-anxiety. We want to de de deconstruct <laughs> this term because okay eco anxiety but uh, the fact is that people are fearing what's next so mm. um, we uh, we would like to um, speak about hope and speak about solutions because there are plenty but um, the media tend to focus on the pathology uh, level of eco anxiety, but when you are reading articles and seeing or hearing stuff, you have no solutions at the end. And mm. uh, solutions exist, and we want to amplify them. Um, and um, on the global health level or public health level, we we want to further collaborate with people that want to promote and prevent health as well. And we are uh, working with associations, foundations um, together to reach that um, uh, goal together. Um, and we, you said before that uh, everyone should be able to understand science and else or something like that. And uh, we are also specializing in simplified writing and yeah. Magali is our specialist uh, at Radar. And um, yeah, we, we would like to contribute to bring health and science closer to society. Yeah. Um, and I've, and also in science and health, people have less um, communication training than in other uh, uh, disciplines. So we are thinking about educating scientists and health professional on uh, public, what is public relation and um, how the long-term approach is important um, and yeah, bring them with us uh, to reach their, their mission because they are great mission right next door and we want to amplify them and bring them to society. 
So radar as both the PR agent you can use when you are seeking great skills and talents in communications, but also radar as an educational partner who can help you and your organization to grow your skills in PR. Is this yes. what I understood? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, in, in, in coaching, we often talk about where focus goes, energy flows. And I was reminded of that quote, um, hearing you talk about the negativity and the fear mongering and the fear based media marketing about uh, this upcoming podcast that you're going to be doing on the, on the on the climate anxieties and, and things like this and and how hard it is to be solution oriented and how, uh, you know, how hard it is to adopt uh, the interest to attract the interest uh, to solutions and to feeling better and to what we can do and to hope and to love. And yet the universal truth is love conquers fear every single day, love conquers fear every single day. And uh, and so I think that that's a pretty darn powerful legacy to be injecting more hope, more love, more kindness, more vibrational energy into what we can do, what is within our capacity, where, what, what are the innovators thinking and how are they responding? Uh, what are the solutions? I think that that's really powerful and I wish to have millions and millions and billions of clicks on on positivity and a lot fewer on fear because I think then the focus will go there. But when you think about your own legacy and if you could design a legacy with your, you know, your main message in it, um, we don't own our own legacies, but I love to ask women this questions uh, because we can take our work and our worth uh, with greater gravitas and seriousness. What do you think about your legacy? What what is this message for you, for the world or the message for future generations that comes out of you, Emily, and you, the organization and team that you have with Radar? Yeah, um, yeah. For me, now that I feel allowed to be kind, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to be kind uh, with as many people as I can. And uh, I think this contributes to, to the next generation as well. And um, I think it's a duty for everyone to protect their children. And uh, I'm going to read this because uh, when I, uh, my child was born, um, a man called Jean-Jacques said, I think, a beautiful message. He said, one more child in the cycle of life reminds me every time of a huge steel ball on which a drop of gold has fallen to embellish it. And I really like that because I think it's so true. And I think every child being born in this world is it's not an opportunity is not the right word, but um, but let's say that because I don't know any better. <laughs> It's uh, an opportunity to to bring together a better world and a better community. And if we can transmit values um, and kindness and love, etc., I I I hope I feel that we can bring in uh, uh, yeah a better humanity or amplify humanity. Um, and. Maybe I, I quote also Katie Mack because I love <laughs> her work, but uh, she reminds us of a place in a vast cosmos. And well, um, when we asked the question, can this all really go on forever? She said, we are implicitly validating our own existence, extending it indefinitely into the future, taking stock and examining all legacy. Uh, and we don't know what what will happen tomorrow if if this expansion will just reduce it in any <laughs> second because it's possible. I read it on on Katie Mack's uh, <laughs> book, and I was like, oh, okay. So the next second we can just yeah, being back to that then state. And if I understood correctly, <laughs> because I'm I'm far from a physicist, but um, and. If everything can change any second, I think the last, the yeah, the least thing we can do is to our breath, doing our best. Mm. Um, and and also one artist friend of mine and um, a psychiatrist um, that we are working with said that creativity is the um, the specialty of uh, human uh, beings. 
and that at every second we can decide to do something else and we at every second we can be creative but every second we can change the world let's say <laughs> and, uh, it's it feels like a lot of freedom it's powerful. I like this uh, this concept of, uh, of of a new beginning and a new birth, and also the light within uh, that you're talking about, uh, helping to amplify um, every voice, every participant, every actor um, who is in research and health sciences and who's a patient and an advocate um, by their own right to their experience. Um, so really, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, folks listening in, if you don't yet have a copy of Inspire Journeys, you can get it at Amazon. It did become an Amazon bestseller. Uh, there are over 100 women involved in this in this book, including over 70 women's headed businesses who contributed to uh, the directory in the back of the book where, um, where you can also see the stories and voices of, of women's actions in the world, women's creations, uh, and you can buy from and promote and elevate and recommend uh, women's headed businesses and be a conscious actor in your own life by also managing what are you reading and what are you consuming and how are you expanding your consciousness about uh, who is a hero and what are these heroes' journeys and hero stories. Um, I love this collection and Emily, I'm so delighted you were able to join us and be, be with us uh, here for those who want to know how to reach you, how to recommend podcast topics, how to recommend youth speakers, how to, uh, you know, those who are leading foundations and organizations, because your work is dead serious. Uh, I mean, you're in health and safety, you're in science, you're in hardcore research. Um, those who want to work with you, they go to radar-rp.ch. Is this the best place? R-A-D-A-R-R-P.ch. Ch, uh, where they can reach Magali Dubois, they can reach Jennifer Le Produr, and they can, of course, reach you, Emily Prelong. Is there anything else that we should be tuning into and listening to? Or uh, any other requests that you want to make to, to listeners? Yeah, you'll find us on, on LinkedIn easily. And I'll add our, our specialized translator, Byron Afshar, as well. Um, and yeah, Jennifer, my Magali, Byron and I are really reachable on LinkedIn and just please connect with us and we'll be glad to enter in conversation with you. Super. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. And, uh, and Emily, thank you for being here with us. I'm so grateful uh, to have had this time with you. Thank you. Likewise, it was great. And I thank you for the invitation. So. <laughs> my pleasure. Take care. Take care.